Hello and welcome to this special 19 minutes, 56 seconds. We are absolutely live on the iGaming Next Power Hour. My name's Ushin Lunny. I'm a journalist, uh, event MC and podcast host for Fortune 500 companies. And of course, the Power Hour is all about giving you the power to make the right decisions, giving you the insights to have a competitive advantage. And I sincerely believe that the next 19 minutes and 33 seconds could be some of the most valuable minutes you spend this year. Uh, we live in an attention economy. We value your attention and we are going to give you a lot of value for your full attention for the next 19 minutes, 19 seconds. And it is a great pleasure to welcome to the iGaming Next Power Hour stage, Peter Eckmark, who is the CEO of Internet Vikings. Welcome, Peter. Great to see you here. Thank you. You really set the, the bar and apply some pressure okay. there <laughs> with that well, introduction. No pressure at all, Peter, no pressure at all. No, I know we've talked already, obviously, and I know that this is so important and it kind of blows my mind that this isn't talked about more sincerely. Uh, it is like you've discovered this privacy time bomb at the heart of iGaming. It's just incredible. And we're going to dive into that. Uh, please do pay attention. There's going to be practical takeaways. You're going to find out exactly what you can do about it and how to stay on the right side of the law on the right side of your customers. But first, Peter, I think it would be great to understand a bit about your background and how you came to be the CEO of Internet Vikings. What's your background in iGaming and um, what's your background in technology as well? Well, to start with, I'm an actually an engineer. I have a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. Would you believe that? But that was a while ago, to be honest, and I don't think I've ever used anything of what I've learned. <laughs> but, uh, so it's almost ancient history. Well, uh, I came into um, the iGaming sector in 2006 um, via a Swedish startup company, which was called Maria Bingo. That was yeah. very soon thereafter acquired by Unibet, where I ended up spending almost eight years. Right. And from there, I went to another Swedish company called Vera and John, who now is part of Gamesys, UK, big nice. UK operator. Yeah. And uh, I went on to Mr. Green, which uh, also was acquired by another big UK, very successful operator called William Hill, who has then been acquired by Caesars in the US. So lots of things happening. And uh, that's why I ended up with Internet Vikings after having spent 14 years plus uh, within the B2C iGaming community, it was uh, it was a very nice change to go to yeah. a a smaller B2B setup. Absolutely. So you're kind of bringing that experience that you have from the iGaming industry, all those years of decades of technology experience, and you're now on the other side of the camera, as it were, providing to uh, some of the top iGaming companies. But we're going to just dive in right away to this issue now. Um, now, of course, you know, iGaming is about money in and money out. And so there are some parallels with other industries, but I don't know if people really appreciate the privacy implications and the tech implications of this, you know, the, the base material of the industry. Talk to us a bit about how, you know, iGaming uh, should be looked at with the same seriousness as the financial services in terms of the privacy issues. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic, and, and like I said, I've been around it for 14 years now, and it's it's also changing uh, at the speed of light almost, and we're entering new markets, and old markets are becoming regu regulated, etc. I'd just like to highlight, though, that I'm by no means a lawyer, so I cannot make any legal advice. Uh, I'm an engineer, <laughs> but but um, so so that's not why we're having this session. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so the, like again, the, the like, privacy, yeah. yeah, the privacy like, within like, financial services is seen. You know, everybody understands it, but the privacy issues in iGaming, you know, maybe certain things have uh, have a, have arrived on the scene without giving the getting the attention they really deserve. Absolutely, I, there are huge similarities in in a way. A gaming company is exactly the same as a bank. You open an account, you deposit money, you withdraw uh, money from that account. So. That's why the, the, the regulatory framework is also uh, very alike, to be honest. In yeah. some areas, I would say it's even tougher for an iGaming operator than, than a bank. And yeah. privacy when it comes to uh, uh, your personal data in that uh, vertical is crucial, I would say. And what we all have in common here in Europe is GDPR. 
Uh, we're not yes. going to go into detail to that, but uh, all of us has gone through it and it wasn't that easy, to be honest. And, and it's something that we have to adhere to. It's all about protecting those um, personal um, details of yours uh, and, and defending your right uh, to protect them. Yeah, indeed. So like, I'm sure everyone on this call is very familiar with GDPR. We know about some of the enormous fines that have been handed out to tech companies that have been on the wrong side of that. And uh, there is a sort of parallel movement in America, a legal precedent um, between the relationship of companies in Europe, companies in iGaming, companies handling data and having a presence in America. And this all falls around uh, something called Schrems 2, which is named after, I believe, the privacy campaigner Maximilian Schrems, which is an epic name. Talk to us a bit yes. about Schrems 2 and what it means for our assumptions around the privacy of data and having a global presence as we are truly in a global industry. True. Um, yes, it's uh, Schrems 2 because there was also a Schrems 1. Yes. He actually sued Facebook uh, to get to uh, Schrems too. And he's also based in Ireland, I believe. But anyways, um, the privacy shield, uh, which was um, actually named Safe Harbor because, before it became privacy shield, it's, it's yeah. really all about protecting the GDPR framework when it comes to transferring data outside of the EU. So the privacy mm -hmm. shield was set up to cater for that relationship with US in particular. And US has a different framework. They do not have GDPR, but they have something called the Cloud Act. And, mm -hmm. and the problem was that what Max highlighted in this case, uh, which was, by the way, ruled by the Court of Justice in EU, was mm -hmm. that it was not adequate. So it didn't protect that personal data in the way it must in order to be compliant. Yeah. So it was overruled and hence the privacy shield is no more. This happened this summer, 16th of July. Uh, and I think that most of our focus at that time, at least mine, was somewhere else. It's been an interesting year for, from so many perspectives, but I mean, Corona was really all over the place. And, and as you know, we also had Brexit at the end of the year. So I think oh, from yeah. the media, medial point of view, um, maybe some of us missed out on it, but it's it's a big thing, absolutely. Totally, so so basically what the Schrems 2 ruling in the European Court of Justice, uh, you know, in kind of simplified terms, it, it said that the privacy is just not adequate um, if you have any kind of data going back and forth to the States, you know, that the, uh, the, the status quo is not protecting your customers. And I think in iGaming, I mean, in finance as well, but in iGaming, you know, very much because you have customers who are high net worth individuals. And I've spoken at a few events for high net worth individuals. And if there's one thing I know that they love, it's privacy. They all love privacy. So there is a huge potential for reputational damage to the iGaming sector for not understanding the implications of this Schrems ruling. Um, I mean, how, how do you think that regulators and operators are keeping up with this? Is there some awareness about it, some general awareness, because you really don't read a lot about it, I think. No, you don't. It's quite surprising, mm. to be honest. Internet Vikings, we are a cloud hosting provider, and, and we do have customers both from the iGaming sector, but also the financing sector. And, and to my surprise, I would say that we've seen a lot of concern from the financial mm. sector, but not so much from the iGaming sector. And, and typically, the iGaming sector is on the forefront of these matters, uh, including yes you know, regulatory uh, marketing issues, because that's what they've had to do in order to come as successful as they have. So that's a bit of a surprise, but maybe, um, you know, the, 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 the events of the year took focus from that. We, we as a company, just actually got through um, an ISO 2701 certification. Yeehaw, that was a big thing. Congratulations. Here. And, yeah. and ISO, the experience, of course, um, is that it's it's all about um, risk management in a way. Yes. So information security, right? And I believe that lots of these companies, including the gaming operators, of course, they, they do have that certification as well. But um, in their next audit, I, I believe this is very likely to be flagged as a high risk. Totally. I mean, that's, you know, this is a time bomb. If you Even if you have ISO 27001 certification uh, or compliance, come your next review, you know, you could be doing something 
highly um, highly damaging to your business. I mean, what would a practical scenario be? What would a like an iGaming operator who's maybe looking to go to America or they have operations in America. I mean, it's the hottest market in the world. Yep. It's one of the places where the iGaming industry is looking to, to expand and to really have that exponential growth. Uh, what are the implications for the iGaming framework with the Schrems 2 ruling, with the Privacy Shield and with expanding into the US? What does that look like? Well, to be honest, entering America, which is a hot topic, of course, doesn't really have any implications um, to the Schrems 2 agreement, because if you are active in the US, you have to adhere to US laws, like the Cloud Act. Um, yes. The problem is more that if you are a European um, entity, you need to adhere to GDPR. And the Cloud yeah. Act and GDPR, they're not compliant, which means that you may have to, if Supuinad, uh, give data personal data, wow. which you cannot do in compliance with GDPR. So you are in a bad place. I mean, uh, it's it's like a, a political law that is not compliant, which needs to be resolved. There is no solution at this point in time. And I think most of wow. the iGaming operators, whether they're in the US or not, they, they are basically obviously using a lot of data and, and they are also cloud hosting. That's where the world is coming to in, 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 in most areas. Yes. If you do so via a, a, a US provider, I mean, we all know that the three big ones, Microsoft, uh, uh, AWS, uh, and, and Google, they're all US entities, which means that they need to adhere to US laws. Whether you know the data is stored in Ireland doesn't matter. There's still a US entity. So if, if that data is, is owned by a, a European arm, it has no effect, unfortunately. So that has to be wow. taken into the equation. And, and that's the problem, which obviously the finance industry, like I said, has really picked up on. And I believe that's probably due to the course that they do send a uh, transaction back and forth from, from the US, of course. So this is a yeah. big risk. And yes, you do not want to expose that data for, for, for uh, unnecessary reasons. It, it's not, 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 not only the iGaming industry, this could be journals, uh, medical journals, et cetera. It's just something that has now been sort of caught in between a rock and a hard place. Between a rock and a hard place. My goodness, that, that is such a good way to put it because you know, you're know you talking about your hosting decisions. They could be in breach of GDPR and we know what kind of fines have been given out for breaches of GDPR. Talk to us a bit about how all of this affects the hosting decisions that iGaming companies need to make. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's their the decision and it's about risk management, like I said. Sure. I, I believe there, there, it would be much easier if you had a a big European competitor with, with mm. the three big ones. At the moment, there is no such competitor. And, and hopefully there will be one eventually. Brexit doesn't yeah. help, but uh, there is a need for one. As a hosting provider, I mean, uh, I would be in error not to say that, of course, we could offer those services. We have competitors that could do the same thing. but. You could use use both services for the redundancy reasons, but to make things easier, I would, if I am active in Europe, use a European supplier. That simplifies the case significantly. That sounds like a no-brainer, to be quite honest. Uh, and uh, you mentioned Brexit there. I'm not sure Brexit is is doing much to to help anything at the moment. You know, remains to be seen. Uh, but it, it really does throw a spanner in, in some of the works here. So. Um, you know, if you're at one of the, you know, top three, top five iGaming companies, you presumably have, you know, floors of lawyers and technicians and privacy experts, and you have a lot of resources to throw at this problem. But what if you are slightly, you know, you're not maybe one of the top five, but if you're slightly down in terms of scale, in terms of market, I mean, how can SMEs, small and medium iGaming companies still win with their hosting choices? Yeah, that's also an interesting one. I mean, iGaming is a business of scale, uh, sure. and the more regulated yeah. it becomes, uh, the more that is proven because the the, the compliance uh, departments tend to to grow uh, exponentially, to be honest, and it's needed, yeah. unfortunately, but that's the way it goes. And if you are a small or medium-sized operator, you, you, you don't have those resources, but you have agility, of course, and you have flexibility. You can choose your solutions in a completely different way and you can change them more rapidly. So that's mm. that's obviously your potential and, and what you should use uh, in order to become big. 
because we've all seen throughout history that the small ones will be the ones that are innovative and eventually will also become big for that reason. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe, I mean, you've kind of spoken about that ability to be agile, to move quickly, to, to evolve quickly, to respond to market trends. What kind of business advantages can the companies, say you work with yourselves at Internet Vikings, what, what advantages can they leverage for things like marketing? I mean, how does the hosting choices that they make uh, advantage other areas that might give them um, a head start in business? Well, we offer uh, different services. It's not only a hosting service. We also have what we call marketing solutions, which comes down to, to brand protection, really. Um, oh, yeah. Hosting set aside is, of course, about protecting data. But what's also interesting for, in particular, a night gaming operator is to, to protect their brand and their brand presence. You can do that in many ways. You obviously have your domain that you need to protect. And, and believe me, if you go east rather than west, you will see lots of attempt to hijack, to, to mimic and to copy, make great variations of your domain just to get the traffic because that's what it's all about. Yeah. And yeah. if you are an established operator and have an established brand in, in Europe or in any market for that matter, you want to protect the traffic that you're getting to your brand. Uh, that's extremely important if you ask me. You, you are marketing your, your brand and that's your bread and butter. The traffic that you get means that you convert customers uh, and, and that's how you survive and grow as a business. So what we offer here uh, within Vikings is measures and methods and products to protect that traffic and those brands. Mm. Trademarking per se doesn't really work on the internet, does it? Um, you, you can show your paper, but I'm sorry, it's not going to work if you have a thousand sites who's just been set up in order to piggyback on the traffic that you're getting from a commercial campaign, et cetera. Mm, interesting. And, and can you apply that, uh, that technology in terms of balancing direct traffic with affiliate traffic, for instance? Because, you know, obviously, you know, you want to work with affiliates and you want to give them what they need, but you don't want them to kind of step in front of direct traffic. So how do you deal with that balance between direct and affiliate um, channels? Affiliation marketing is a very important uh, method of marketing for, for iGaming operators. It's, it's typically totally. almost up to 50% of their marketing budget. So it's extremely important uh, and it's a very competitive marketplace. We do not compete with affiliates. What we do is to protect the brand. We are protecting the marketing investment that the actual brand owner does in their brand in order to make sure that they get the traffic uh, mm -hmm. from that investment. So we complement, uh, in a way, affiliation marketing. Affiliation marketing is about uh, being ranking on, on best sports book, best casino. We don't do that. We help the brand owner to get the ROI from their marketing investment because it comes down to the traffic, right? And you don't want any spills or, or, or unnecessary waste from that traffic. Totally. Again, there, and there, another, there, there, another thing yeah, you, that you can kind of bring to the table is strategic deployment geographically. And talk to us a bit about how that can help by gaming companies, the actual location of the servers. If, if you are, Depending on where you're active, uh, you, you, in, the, in the, the iGaming space, it comes down to latency, I would say. Mm -hmm. And you have yes. many ways of, of working with latency because no customer will want to wait uh, for delays. If you want to play a sports bet, for instance, that's not acceptable. And if you want to play a, a slot or anything like that, you, you cannot wait for 30 seconds for it being launched. So it's about yeah. where you strategically position your data centers. We have data centers in Taipei. That's for the Asian market. We have a data center in Singapore. That's for the Indian market. Uh, Amsterdam, Sweden. We also have one in Sao Paulo and Sydney, et cetera, et cetera. And those are specifically selected uh, geographically for those marketings. And it comes down to latencies. Fantastic. OK, if you want to expand into Asia, LATAM, India, speak to Peter. Now, speaking of 30 seconds and the latency, we're coming to the end of our session. But I have one more question. Talk to us quickly about how iGaming companies can effectively leverage data, because I know that's something that you guys do. Or is it AI? Yeah, data is everything. 
that's how we incrementally improve our business. Uh, you will see many successful iGaming operators having big uh, BI departments. Okay. And so yes, we can have that. It's Okay, we're actually run out of time. We are completely live. We're running a tight ship. Thank you so much, Peter Ekmark, CEO of Internet Vikings. Thanks for joining us on the iGaming Power Hour, iGaming Next. See you next time. My name's Oshin Dunny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Taxi Mika.